On today, in the International Sunday School lesson, we're dealing with praise. Praise for God's eternal reign. We're in the lovely book of Revelation, verses or chapter 11, verses 17 through 9. Make sure you download your notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comment section where you see my name. I'll also leave a link above my head. Click one of those links, download your notes, get your Bibles and your Sunday school for the International Sunday School is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Teaching the word of God. Well, well, and well, what a beautiful day it is for us to be here together. I'm Pastor Rodney Jones, pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries, Church of God in Christ, Chicago, Illinois, 60620. If you have any prayer requests, make sure you drop me an email so that I can answer or even pray for you. Make sure you also click that subscribe button and that bell notification that way YouTube will notify me or you each week through your email. Bing! Brother Jones just uploaded another lesson. If this is your first time, please make sure that you leave me a note or comment in the comment section below. Hey, this is my first time viewer. I want to say thank you and welcome to the Sunday School as taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. Uh, we have a good lesson on the day. We're dealing with praise for God's eternal reign. We're in the 11th chapter of the book of uh, Revelations, verses 15 through 19. Our date for discussion is November the 14th, 2021. Today being Thursday, being Veterans Day, today is my official birthday. Yes, I just made another year old today. I am happy. I'm excited to be here and to be alive on this, my birthday. Listen, so do you know, two brief announcements. On this coming Saturday, which is in a couple of days, there will be a drive-by, not a shooting, but a drive-by salute to me, uh, November the 13th, between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock at the church. For those of you who would like to come by and give support, or if you're not able to drive by, there's your ways of giving right there. I'm going to move on. If you need to see it again, just be kind and rewind. And lastly, I'm celebrating 20 years as an ordained elder. Yes, 20 years as an ordained elder on the 14th. That's November the 14th from 4 to 6. And we will be streaming a portion of that live on Facebook and this YouTube channel. I would love for you to come by and those of you who just want to come by and celebrate with us. It would be an honor. It is in-house. You're welcome to come. Uh, let me get right into this particular lesson. Now we're in the book of Revelation and Revelation has kind of like brought a lot of misunderstanding to people. When you're reading the uh, uh, apocalyptic, woo -hoo -hoo, I probably should not even try to say that. But when you're reading the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, and even some parts of Isaiah, you've got to understand how it is written, the language and the format that it is written in. And in the book of Revelations, beginning from chapter one all the way until its conclusion, we have or we see what we call the representatives of something. And I believe, for instance, now I'm not a specialist in the book of Revelation. I don't proclaim to be. But I believe that in the fourth chapter up to the sixth chapter, the church has already been raptured. And so we'll see certain names as elders and somewhat which we think are representatives of the church. You might see these 24. I don't know. It is not biblical, but it is stated 
that 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the other 12 represents the 12 apostles who Jesus did say that they would reign with him or sit on the throne with him. So as I always say, I'm going to teach the lesson in the context that it is in. I might have a backdrop of the church in the back of my head. I might pull it out. I might not. Because since scripture is absent in a lot of things, I believe we need to be absent in those things as well. So John, he was invited up to heaven to view the things that was to come. That's Revelation, the fourth chapter, the first verse, which this history will possibly stay on most of my notes. Immediately, scripture says that he was in the spirit and he saw a throne in heaven, Revelation 4 and 2. And what he saw was 24 elders. He saw 24 seats and he saw 24 elders that were sitting in the seat. Uh, that was Revelations 4 and 4. And each of them wore golden crowns or crowns of gold. Same chapter. He also saw four beasts that was around them as well. So he says, in the hand of him that sat on the throne was a book written. That's the fifth chapter and the first verse. And in it had seven seals. Now these seals were seals that only the Lord Jesus, who was the lamb, could open up. Because John began to cry. And somebody told them, don't weep. Because the lamb, the lamb of God, the one which was slain, he is worthy to not only look upon them, but he was worthy to loose the seal and to look upon them. And uh, each time, you'll find that in the fifth chapter, in the fifth verse. And each time a seal was opened, there was some form or some type of judgment or something took place in between or after each of those seals. Now we'll get right into the lesson. So from this moment, each seal was opened and a judgment was sent. That's Revelation, the sixth chapter, verses one. Let's look at the first lesson. Now, y'all let me know because I'm trying different formats and I want the people to be comfortable with viewing. So I try different formats to see what's good for the general population, the general population and not necessarily for one person. He says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. He says the seventh seal or the seventh angel sounded. And the word sounded here means to sound a trumpet. It means to blow a trumpet because this took place after the opening of the seventh seal, which is Revelation, the eighth chapter, verses one through two. This is the last of the seven trumpets to be sounded by the angels. There were seven angels and each of them bore a trumpet. Revelations one or Revelations eight, one through two. Each angel sounded a trumpet and an event took place after they sounded. So you got seven seals, you got seven trumpets, you got seven candlesticks. It's a whole lot that's taking place that deals with the number seven in heaven. And that rhymes. And I didn't even try to do it. Mm. I'm a poet and didn't know it. Come on, somebody. So this angel sounded the trumpet, which appears to be slightly different than the rest of the angels. Because this one announces that God's kingdom is now taking over all of the kingdoms. Let's look at these seven angels that were sounding these seven trumpets. The first angel, he sounded and there came hell and fire mingled with blood. That's Romans or Revelations, the eighth chapter in the seventh verse. The second angel, he sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire, cast into the sea, Revelations 8 and 8. The third angel, third angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. That's Revelations 8 and 12. Then the fifth angel sounded, and a star fell from heaven, and he had the keys to the bottomless pit. That's Revelation 9 and 1. The sixth angel sounded, and four angels were to be loosed, who slayed a third part of men, that's Revelations 9 and 13. And then lastly, the last and final angel to sound a trumpet, 
and the last of events that would take place. Revelations 10 and 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he have declared to his servants the prophets. It says, And there were voices in heaven. Now, Scripture doesn't identify who these voices were, but we understand that these voices began to lift up and they began to celebrate God. They could be celebrating God because they can see that his full plan is now coming into play. I believe it was Ephesians, the third chapter in the 10th verse, talks about the fact that the angels now understood the plan of God after they saw the church being fulfilled. So though they are in heaven, that doesn't mean that they understand all the works of God. Scripture says that they were saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And he uses the word Lord, which means owner. It means master. It means supreme in authority. The term become denotes a change of state. Something is now taking place or about to take place. These kingdoms of the earth have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and this great celebration breaks forth in these voices in heaven. All kingdoms now submit unto the kingdom of the Lord. Now this, I believe, is a prophecy that's being fulfilled uh, in Daniel, the second chapter and the 44th verse. Uh, yes, he spoke about something similar to this same event. This could also be an answer to the Lord's prayer, which he gave to the, the disciples. And in, in, in it, it says, thy kingdom come, which is Matthew 6 and 10. We understand that the kingdom of God had come when Jesus came, but now this would be the kingdom of God coming in its fullness. Yes, Psalm 72 and 11 says, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. Now he says of the Lord and of his Christ, and the word Christ means the anointed. The word Christ means the Messiah. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is who he is and his position. He is God's anointed and he is anointed. Did you hear me? He is his anointing or his anointed and he himself is anointed. Jesus is called the Christ of God which means he is the anointed of God. He is the Messiah of the Old Testament. Even Peter said that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Matthew 16 and 16. Jesus says that he was the Messiah, which was to come in John 4, 25 through 26, while he was talking to the woman at the well. Andrew told Peter, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. That's John, the first chapter, verses 41. The Lord shall reign forever unto all generations. That's Psalm 146 and 10. And then lastly, I need you to hear me and hear me well. The Bible lets us know that when it's all said and done, that Christ was going to take the kingdom and place all things back into the hands of his God or into the hands of God, the Father. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 24. So they said, uh, and he shall reign forever. And the word reign means to rule, to be king. As the great king forever, he will reign forever. And there will be no ending to his kingdom. Let's look at verses 16. And the four and 20 elders which sat before God. Look at where they're seated. And look at the fact that they are seated. There's 24 elders which sat before God on their seats. Look at what they did. They fell upon their faces and worshiped God. They fell upon their faces. The four and 20 elders. Now we find these 24 elders sitting in seats about the throne in Revelations four and four. They were clothed in white raiment and they wore crowns of gold, Revelation 4 and 4. They worshiped God and they cast their crowns before the throne, 
Revelations 4 and 10. Now Habakkuk 2 and 3 says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Get that. It's for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. So some of this that we're reading in the book of Revelation has not taken place yet. It is for an appointed time. So the question comes up, who are these 24 elders? Scripture doesn't tell us who they are, but it tells us that they are 24. It is believed that they are the representatives of the church. So each of these that we see in heaven are a representative of the church or of something. Scripture states, number one, that they were seated. That's Revelation 4 and 4. Number two, it says that they all had crowns, Revelations 4 and 10. That's unique because uh, who angels don't have crowns and I don't believe that they are given seats to be seated. So they're seated for a purpose. Scripture says that the saints will also judge the world. First Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses two to four. And the fact that they wore crowns means that they must have received these by some type of reward. So these that are seated in heaven uh, have a reward and the reward is the crowns. Now the Bible speaks about that the, the saints are going to receive the crown of life. That's James 1 and 12 and 2 Timothy 4 and 8. I believe that there are some 6, 7, 8 or whatever different uh, crowns that we will receive based on and depending who you are and the accomplishments. Yes, there are more than one crown. It's more than just the crown of life. So the fact that they have a seat lets us know that it appears that they will be judges as well. And the Bible says, no, uh, that the angels, uh, I'm sorry, no angels will judge anything. That's it. But the saints are going to judge the angels. First Corinthians six and three. So it cannot be that these elders are angels. All that just to say that which sat before God on their seats. And what they did was they fell before their faces and they worshiped God. And the word worship means to do reverence, to prostrate. It's an act of homage or an act of reverence because they recognize that in the presence of God, that the crowns that they have is not worthy. Even for them, they bow down. They get out of their seats of judgment. They bow down with their faces to the ground. They take their crowns off and they put it at the feet of him who is worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the splendor. So John mentions three things about these elders in the verse. Number one, they all had seats before the throne, which was provided by them, for them, by God. Number two, they all removed themselves from their posture of sitting to their posture of bowing down. And then number three, they all began to, to worship God. Very interesting. I love how he puts that into play. Verses 17, excuse me, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. So these 20 and four or 24 elders bowing down says we give thanks. And the word thanks means well pleasing. It means to show oneself grateful or to even be thankful. So the first thing they do is after bowing down before the Lord is they open up their mouth and they begin to offer up the sacrifices of their lips as we would call it they begin to thank him for who he is and thank him because of what he has done. And then they call him this, what I call a threefold name. They address God by three unique names while bowing. They call him Lord, which means master and owner. They call him God, which means the true God. And then they call him almighty, which is a compound word meaning ruler over all or omnipotent. 
So they call him the Lord God Almighty. When you spoke to or speak that together, it means God all powerful. Nothing and no one can do the things that God has done. Look at what he did. Uh, scripture lets us know that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then God established a world on earth. He made the earth out of nothing, but he made man out of the earth. And then he made woman out of man. And then he allowed the two of them to come together with seed. And then a child is born and he populated. The enemy came in. And, rep, and, and brought havoc in the house. Uh, uh, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying, when I say the enemy, I mean Lucifer fell and became Satan. And then throughout, he tried to conquer the plan of God. But God has a masterful plan. And the angels could see the plan of God all of these many years. And now they see the fullness of his plan. And they begin to celebrate God and these Elders began and they called him, O oh Lord God Almighty, because everything moves by the power of God. The saints are even kept by the power of God, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 7, and the powers that be on earth are ordained of God. That's Romans, the 13th chapter. Now they mention a threefold thing about him, which art, which was, and art to come. They describe the eternal nature of God. God has always been, God is always, and God will always be. Because there is no beginning, no end to him. He's called the self-existent God. John describes God at the beginning of his vision as the same way in Revelation, the first chapter and the fourth verse. The Lord identifies himself as the same, Revelation 1 and 8. And then even the four beasts said the same thing in worship to God about him. That's Revelations 4 and 8 as well. He even told Moses, I am that I am in Exodus the third chapter in the 14th verse, which because that means the word am means to exist. And he says, I am or I exist because I exist. I am the self-existing God. Revelation 1 and 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned, they praise God in celebration that he now takes and begins his rule in his kingdom on earth. They have seen the events that have taken place from the first trumpet, from the first angel, from the first everything up until now. They see the plan of God unfolding. Now they see that God he's, is establishing not only his kingdom on earth, but he is taking control. He is taking what's rightfully his. When you look at Psalm 21 and 13, he says, Be thou exalted, Lord, in thine own strength. So will we sing and praise thy power. Isaiah 52 and 10 says, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord. Let's look at verses number 18. And the nations were angry. Now watch this. It goes to show you that everybody is not on God's side and everybody ain't happy with the work of God. The angels were, ne the, the nations were angry and thy wrath is come in the time of death that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Very unique how it is written. Everyone apparently is not going to rejoice at the workings of God. There are some enemies and these elders recognize this and John saw this in his vision. Now he says two things have come. His wrath has come and the time of the dead to be judged has come. He mentions four actions of God. His wrath has come. He is to judge the nations. He is to give rewards unto his servants. 
and he should destroy those which destroyed the earth. Now, the ones who are going to receive this reward are three categories. Those are the prophets, those are the saints, and them that fear his name, whether they are the great or the small, makes no difference, but they are going to receive the reward from God. So he says, and the nations were angry, and uh, thy wrath is come. The word angry means to feel and to express strong displeasure and hostility. Now, he mentions anger, but then he mentions the wrath of God, which is violent passion. God's wrath means his vengeance, and his wrath means punishment. Wrath, I'm told, is anger in action. Yes. So these nations were already angry at the fact that God had already set up his kingdom. They didn't like it because God is not just now setting up his kingdom. His kingdom has already been set up. But they are now really expressing it as well, especially when they see some other things that take place. So the wrath of God is also now about to come. So God is about to pour out his wrath, his displeasure against them. Then he mentions part two and the time of the dead that they should be judged. This has come now as well. And the word judge means to condemn, to punish to conclude or even to determine because the word judge doesn't always mean bad. Everybody on the face of the earth judge. And I need to say this. I'm going to say it and keep moving. The Bible never said not to judge. He says, judge not lest ye also be judged. And the key thing he says is the same judgment that you use to judge or the same thing that you use to meter out your judgment is going to be used against you. I need you to know that he says that the saints should judge the smaller matters as well in the church. To judge means to give a decision or an opinion based on something that you have already saw. It means to weigh it against something. And every day we have made judging wrong. It is not wrong. It is not a sin to judge. And even when a believer or someone commits sin and a brother comes to them to bring correction, they holler, don't judge me. And I'm going to be honest with you. You're out of order to do that. They have to judge you so that you can be pulled right back into the fellowship. You got any more questions, send that email and I'll give you some more scripture and understand. So the main focus of the world judge is to receive a final sentence or a reward. It is that they will be judged for the bad and not the good. And this is a connection to Daniel, the 12th chapter and the second verse. He says that many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt but they all are going to be judged and to receive. And usually the word judge means the final sentence. But he says, and thou, and that thou shouldest give reward. Now you're going to judge the others, but you're going to give reward unto thy servants, the prophets. And the word reward means pay for service. It's another word for wages. The wages of death is sin, but the gift of God is salvation or eternal life. So those that didn't honor the Lord or those that didn't honor the Lord would receive judgment and destruction. Those that obey the Lord would receive a just reward. The prophets were the servants of God and no prophet, hear me now, no prophet can ever prophesy something that has not been given by God for them to prophesy. You ain't going to like me what I'm about to say to you next. If you prophesy something that God tells you to prophesy, you need not use the words, I declare and decree. Because once you prophesy what God has spoken, it has already been spoken. It's done. When we add anything such as I declare and I decree, I'm a sh mm. Woo! You're on some shaky ground. Uh, and, and, and matter of fact, check that word out. You'll probably find that in the book of Job and you might not find the two of them together. I'm just going to keep moving on this camera and that was free. I'm going to keep moving. 
So many of the prophets were killed by men. That's Matthew 23 and 31. But they are going to receive a reward. Now, he doesn't limit this reward to the prophets. I'll say this again. A prophet only prophesies what has been given to him or her by God to speak. God does not honor your word. The purpose of you being a prophet is because you're speaking what God says for you to speak. So the reward is going to go to his servants, the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear him. And the word saints means holy. It means to be set apart. It means sanctified or the consecrated one. These are the ones who love the Lord. These are the ones to, who fear him, which means to be in awe, to revere, to be rev to reverence. And it also means to be afraid of. They will receive a reward from God as well. And lastly, he says, and should us destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, though he uses the word destroy twice, I need you to know that they both fit, which the word destroy means to corrupt, to waste, or to bring to decay. It also means to ruin or to become ruined. Now, he would bring corruption to those that corrupted the earth. When you look at 1 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. The church is the temple of God. Isaiah 26 and 21, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and so shall no or and shall no more cover her slain. So he is going to corrupt those who have corrupted or caused to be corrupted or caused to be ruined. Those who have caused corruption upon the earth is what he's referencing to. Then we get to this last verse, which is a very short one. It says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And it's got to be a beautiful thing for him to be able to see this in a vision. What glory he was able to see this. He says, and there was seen in his temple. Now look at what's in the temple of God, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail, all of which was in the temple. Now, it's interesting about this lightning. The lightning is what took place at the giving of the law. You'll find that in Exodus, the 19th chapter, I believe it is verses 16 through 19, or even Exodus, the 20th chapter. He says, and the temple of God was open. The word temple means the sanctuary. It is the holy place. It's the dwelling place. The temple of God is the dwelling place of God in heaven. The tabernacle on earth was a pattern of the one in heaven. That's Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. On earth presently, his temple are the saints. That's 1 Corinthians, the third chapter and the 13th verse. So John sees the temple of God, the dwelling place of God. As Isaiah saw the same thing in Isaiah 6 and 1. He says, in the year King Ozai died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So he says, there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. The ark of his testament is also called the ark of the covenant, and you'll find that in Exodus, the 25th chapter, verses 21 through 22. The ark represented the presence of God with Israel, and God would meet them at the ark, uh, 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 yes, and when, not only that, but the ark represents that God was with Israel wherever they went. So he is called the mercy seat, which is where Moses or the high priest would go into there and hear from God. Judgment, woe, or whatever, what direction or whatever, that's where God would meet them. You'll find that in Exodus the 25th chapter, verses 21 to 22. So he mentions these lightnings, these voices, these thunderings, these earthquakes, and these great hails. These are all in the presence of God and his Christ. 
And these are all at his disposal to use according to his judgment that is needed. And these serve also as a reminder to John of what took place in Exodus, the 19th chapter through the 20th chapter. The Lord came down in the midst of this lightning, of this thundering, of this earthquake, of this mountain smoking and being on fire. So this verse, I believe, and it's believed by others, is actually a part of the next chapter. I'm not sure why the writers of the Sunday school chose to use this. But however, they chose to use this as well. Let's not forget that old drive-by that's coming up this coming Saturday. And let's not forget uh, that birthday celebration if you feel to. Those of you who would like to support what I do, I want to thank you all for your cards, your letters, and for your different ways that you have supported me. I don't normally ask people for supporting me, but you all have been doing an awesome job. I really appreciate you all. You all make it possible for me to continue to do what I do. This is my full time now. I'm putting my carpentry and all that on the back burner, and I'm going to the next plateau, the next height, the next level, the next dimension with uh, this teaching, with my Sunday school, with the ministry, and whatever. And so I praise God. Make sure you leave some comments at the bottom. Leave comments at the bottom to let me know what are your thoughts about this lesson. What are the angles that you like? What is your favorite passage? Or what is it that uh, uh, you might agree with or, or maybe you disagree with? Now remember, when you're dealing with the book of Revelation, let's not go too deep into some things. I mentioned on last week that he mentions the, the judgment or great tribulation, and I felt not the need to go into the post-trib, the mid-trib, the pre-trib. To me, it was not important to take that into a Sunday school class session because it was not what it was really about. Today, we're dealing with praise for God's eternal reign. God is now reigning. He is what I believe in his fullness of uh, his reigning. Now, I chose not to deal with the millennial and, and the whole nine yards because I didn't really want to get into another segment. I need you to understand some things I choose not to put in the lesson purposely because what we could do, we can reference so much or go in so deep until we lose the main focus of the lesson. I love you all. Uh, if the Lord say the same, if, um, if it be his will, if the creek don't rise, and if the late delay is coming, I will see you all Sunday morning at the 9 a.m. o'clock for our live sessions. We keep it real as well. Uh, those of you that can and will, just wish me a happy birthday down there. I appreciate you all. I'm going to go out, and once I find one of my, yeah, I'm going to use this outro. I see you all. Remember my motto. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. And I'm getting ready to upload the Kojic lesson as well. And the Sunday school lesson is a child saved. It's a soul saved plus a life. Amen. <laughs>